<laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. The, our next panelist is uh, Ms. Mary Olson. She is the director of the Southeast Office of the Nuclear Information and Resource Service. Uh, thank you for coming, Mary. Thank you for this opportunity. My name is Mary Olson. I do work for Nuclear Information and Resource Service, often called in the world NEARS. And uh, I want to personally thank the three commissioners to whom I'm speaking and express the hope that some of the others might watch the webcast later. I was so looking forward to giving a uh, radiation lesson to the senator and had hoped we might have a conversation. So <laughs> I'll hold it for the future. Um, I bring also two items I want to put in the record with the specific statement on film that these are copy left, which means that if you post it on your website, there's no problem. My organization was involved in producing both of these. They're short, less than a half hour. One Climate of Hope takes on the whole issue of whether nuclear power is in fact carbon free and whether it can in fact offset enough carbon to meaningfully contribute to the climate crisis. It's not the content of my comments today, but I submit it to the record. And Wastelands, which is an incredible film produced during the life of Grace Thorpe, uh, daughter of Jim Thorpe, who uh, along with several of us in the NGO world, helped turn back the targeting of Native American lands for high-level nuclear waste. And I sincerely hope that we will not repeat that shameful piece of our history in the recent past. 27 tribes were um, specifically targeted for an MRS during those years, and this film documents those voices. We will certainly get those into the public record on the website. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, radiation is why I'm here today. The two questions you gave us, really, if it weren't for ionizing radiation, we wouldn't bother, you know? I'm not saying we'd all sign up and say we love nuclear energy, but I don't think that we would have the level of concern uh, that we have. And I, I was inspired this morning to add that I've been in my job for 20 years, and the reason I have this job is in part because six years before that I was in a research lab that had a lot more ionizing radiation than most research labs have, and unfortunately I got it and took it home. So um, that's changed my life, and I work with many people who have a similar level of experience uh, directly. So we were founded in 1978. Where am I? Okay. Is that how that works? Yeah. Okay. Founded in 1978 by grassroots activists in communities. Um, not everybody's an activist, but most of us are. And they were opposing the construction of new reactors at that time in 1978 in their communities. Today we have members in all 50 states. And I would say that one of the failings of our community is that we never trumpeted the fact that we had a three-quarters victory. Uh, over 400 reactors were on line under construction or on order. When we were founded, only 120 were built. And a number have been closed by the activists in communities that have shared these concerns. So we have a disproportionate representation in our membership of people in reactor communities existing and proposed nuclear waste sites. And I'll just mention that in addition to the 20 seven tribal sites, there's a number of other high-level waste sites that we've been involved in during the 20 years I've been on staff, and over 20 so-called low-level waste targeted communities have come to us during the same period. So we've been very involved with all of these issues, um, and I hope that uh, my colleague Diane Dorigo will have the chance to uh, address some of the, the issues as well. And I just want to mention that we did, in 1998, petition then Secretary of Energy Richardson to disqualify Yucca Mountain. And again, we could share more about that another day. Um, but if it weren't for radiation, we wouldn't be here. And so given that fact, I want to focus on it. There is no safe dose. And all it takes is a single cell and a single radioactive emission to start a fat fatal cancer. Obviously, it doesn't happen every time. But every single event carries that risk. And it's not just, you know, a little tongue in cheek here, it's not just a folk song. This is enshrined in the Environmental Protection Agency standards. It's reflected in NRC's Part 20 and ALARA. The National Academy of Sciences series of reports, seven reports now on the biological effects of ionizing radiation have upheld this view. And most important, I will be sending an annotated bibliography of studies with data that support this view. A lot of people don't know that you can actually see the damage of radiation. Most of it's so small that artists have to sort of render uh, pictures of tracks in cells, and, uh, but you can see broken chromosomes. I didn't bring that picture. Um, 
You can see other structures damaged, cell membranes damaged. This is a picture of what happens to plutonium in a lung. I know none of the commissioners are trained in biology or medicine, and I just want to share that I was trained as a biologist, and I track radiation issues very closely. The Department of Energy has had a low-dose program that I think is well worth looking at what they've been doing. Um, and basically, you have to say that it all boils down to what's acceptable. You know, what as a society do we accept? When I was a child, there was debate about one in a million deaths coming from an industrial activity. Superfund turned to one in a hundred thousand, but then with some very challenging cleanups, some of them are as high as one in ten thousand people exposed getting fatal consequences. Um, so what do we accept from radiation? And I just want to look not at the radical points of view, but at the U uh, U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission's own dose response, which was a rare moment of disclosure that happened in 1990 when they published the Below Regulatory Concern Statement, the other BRC. Every time I hear BRC, I'm having flashbacks because this was the issue that brought me into this work, was the deregulation of radioactive waste in that policy statement. They published their own assessment. And this slide is elaborated. Um, but basically, NRC said that you get 3.5 fatal cancers per 1,000 exposed. But the truth is that's 1,000 adult males exposed. What I've added on here is the findings about the exposure at that level to embryos, first male and then female, because we also have findings saying that women are 50% more vulnerable to ionizing radiation health effects than men. Now, actually, I'm going to go back for a second because I want to disclose that I am including all radiation health effects when I'm looking at the embryo. If we only looked at cancer, which would be the more fair comparison with the NRC's own 3.5 fatal cancers per 1,000 people exposed, then we would only see a four times increase. But it is a four times increase. So forgive me, it was late night. I made the wrong choice maybe, but I'm disclosing that. So somewhere between four and 20 times more impact to the unborn child. And what is this from? This is from 100 millirems a year over a lifetime. So this is perfect performance. This is not accident. This is not high risk. This is, we accept this at this time. So again, women have more vulnerable tissue. That accounts for why we have a higher cancer rate. It's not some weird gender thing. It's visible in our bodies. So do the simple math. NRC assumes linearity. So if you double your dose, you double your response. I just did the same simple division years ago and found that 3.5 can fatal cancers in 1,000, and I'm adding men, uh, results in 1 in 286. And I think it was a bombshell. I don't think the NRC folks had ever done that simple division. Um, they got kind of nervous. Uh, then you add the 1.5 and you're up to 1 in 191 women. Again, this is non-accident normal operations. Actually very good because the licenses all allow more than 100 millirems. Of course, Alara brings it down, but fuel cycle facilities, they don't do so well with Alara. Um, we don't know about waste facilities. They're all leaking. We know that at low-level sites. So you get down to the numbers for impacts, again, all types of impacts in utero, and it's pretty high, really. I mean, you get to one in almost 10 potential outcomes. Now, again, does this happen every day? I'm not asserting that. I'm just saying this is NRC's own assessment of risk of the numbers that they consider allowable. I'm not changing them. So when you apply it to the whole U.S. population at the rate of, you know, a thousand here, a thousand there, a thousand all over, the numbers aren't small. There's a non-fatal cancer for every fatal cancer. That's well understood. And as I say, we're talking about things like spontaneous abortion in terms of the impacts to embryos. But the next slide is very interesting. A lot of people in the industry think that background radiation is nothing and that there's no impact on us from it. And that all of this stuff about dose response is like extra insurance so that if people screw up, there's room to move. But in fact, there's background cancer from background radiation. And when I started this work, 100 millirems a year was what was touted as background radiation. I'm not going to go up to 360. It looks even worse if you do that. Um, so basically, if we allow up to 100 millirems a year from annual operations of a nuclear facility, we're doubling the dose of ionizing radiation to ourselves, to our public, to our family over 100 millirem background. So 
with a linear model, that doubles the response. And I just like to remind people that, you know, if you doubled all kinds of parameters like carbon or temperature or anything else, I mean, as a biologist, it's no surprise to me that you would see some effects from this. And if you go out and talk to people about cancer, we can't prove what causes which cancer, but you also can't prove that something didn't cause that cancer. If you have somebody who loses a child, you can't prove why, but you can't prove it wasn't why. So I'm going to note that I have more to give to in this proposal in this presentation, but I just want to share very quickly uh, the two graphs that you probably have never seen in your life because dose response, you can understand it's linear, you double the dose, you double the effects. But this is the life cycle. This is what I've showed you on the bar chart. This is the embryo responding, stabilizing the adult, and it's Alice Stewart's work that shows us that you have an uptick at the end of life. The health care debate, I'm not even going to go there about care of elders, but the point that I'm bringing to you from the communities as a mother, from all the mothers I speak for, we cannot disregard the impact to the children. Standard reference men cannot reproduce by themselves. We have to look at this. and. Uh, there's the chart with the females added. It doesn't go high enough, actually. You've got to double that, you know, one and a half times for the girls. And uh, finally, skipping several things here. Oh, I do want to say, part of why I'm here, plutonium, it's twice as bad as uranium. What elected official should ever sign off on that? I mean, there's no elected official alive and in office today is responsible for the uranium fuel cycle. But to sign off on a doubling of all this with plutonium, which is what you get, I don't, I don't think there's any elected official, if they were fully disclosed, could or would do that. Now, AP 1000, you'll have to read it later. But this is the slide I want to end with and the next one. Because there's been a lot of ideology expressed over the last day. And I do want to come forward with the fact that I really am pro-nuclear. It's just I like my reactor 93 million miles away. And uh, we've heard a lot of testimony about nuclear's role in the climate crisis. And I asked this committee, I don't think it's necessarily your job to do a full NEPA analysis on the decision to spend billions, possibly even into trillions of dollars on building a new build on nuclear as the, you know, the justification given for this money being spent in the public sector is the climate crisis. I agree we must address the climate crisis, but where's the NEPA analysis showing that this is the cost-effective way to do it? And this year marks the historic crossover in which a healthy energy source, the, the Rolls-Royce, PV, I mean retail PV, I mean call the guy and have him put it on your roof PV, is now cheaper and going down while nuclear per unit of electricity that would be generated is, has passed that going up. So we call it the historic crossover and on the behalf of all of those children who, you know, who knows, but there's, there's future generations and on their behalf I'm here to say we have better alternatives, we can do better. The experiment is over. There's no reason to restart it. Thank you. Thank you.